Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Welcome to Brave New World. My guest today is John Sexton, former president of NYU. John has been a real visionary in education. He established NYU's presence in the global landscape as a global network university with degree-granting campuses in Abu Dhabi and Shanghai. John is a legal scholar and has had a most interesting career that includes clerking at the Supreme Court for a number of chief justices and seeing the legal process operate from the inside. I've learned all kinds of interesting things from him over the years and always see the world a little differently after talking to him. John is author of a book called Standing for Reason, where he talks about the key role that universities play in society. They provide a special space for debate and dialogue. Incidentally, John was the national debating champion out of high school. And in his book, he describes active listening and a progressive deepening of the argument as the essence of debate and hence progress. I think that's great advice for young people. Always listen actively and challenge your beliefs. Looking forward to talking to John today about a number of things like religion and law and education and government in the emerging world of AI and data. John, welcome to Brave New World. I am delighted to have you on the show. I'm delighted to be here, my friend. John, there are a number of topics I want to cover with you around the nature of our laws and their evolution, and also about education. But first, I want to start with your story. In reading your book, Standing for Reason, I noticed that you graduated with a GPA of 2.1 out of college, not something I would have expected. What's the deal with that? So there's a bit of a, an apologia pro vita sua, but let me just start with the facts. The facts are that uh, I was identified by the Jesuit priests who had educated me in high school, where I did very well and where I graduated as the national high school debate champion, as well as the salutatorian of the class. So I came storming out of high school, uh, identified by the Jesuits as someone in whom they should invest. And I believe they always had a sub rosa agenda of trying to recruit me for the order. And I was recruited to Fordham. In those days, those of us that came out of Catholic high schools literally were not allowed to apply to non-Catholic colleges, with the one exception of the military academies. God and country. This is the 1950s. It's a very simple world, and it's the zenith, really, of Catholic triumphalism in a traditional sense. So Fordham was arguably, at that point, the strongest uh, Catholic university in the country, and I was recruited there by a phenomenal educator, a man named Timothy Healy, who at that time was a young Jesuit priest. Tim Healy went on to take a third-rate university called Georgetown and turn it into the Georgetown that we know it today. He was a transformative president of uh, Georgetown University and then came back to New York and was the head of the New York Public Library. Very charismatic figure. He had been himself, uh, I think, a Rhodes Scholar. And he recruited me to be a Fordham Rhodes Scholar. He, that was his aspiration. It was a specific agenda that he used. I, and here's the apologia, I was a year and a half younger than most of the other people in class. I started college at the age of 16, and I arrived up at the Fordham campus and entered Healy's honors program to be sculpted the way he wished. And uh, in my first semester there, my father died, not suddenly, but, but it, was, it must have triggered something in me. And for some reason, I can't quite explain why I did this, I decided to get on a subway, take an hour and 15 minute subway ride out to Brooklyn to an all girls Catholic high school that my sister was attending. And I rang the doorbell to the convent where the nuns who were running the school lived. And I asked to see the principal. I didn't even have the sophistication to find out her name in advance. I asked to see the principal. And she graciously came in and I proposed to her. 
here I am, 17 by this point. I proposed to her that uh, she allow me to begin a high school debating team at the school. I said, I'll take care of it all. I know how to do this. I'm the national high school debate champion. And if you let me teach these young women, I promise you they'll they'll all go to college and they'll all get scholarships to college and they'll win the national championship. We'll put the school on the map and all raise the money to get to the tournaments. And uh, all you'll have to do is take the glory. And for some reason, preposterous as it sounds, she said, if you can persuade any of the young women to join, you can do it. And she called an assembly. My poor sister, I hadn't told my sister I was doing this. My sister was entering her senior year. And my poor sister came into the assembly and there on the stage is her <laughs> older brother. You know, here, she's finally made it to senior year. This is her school, you know. <laughs> and, and there I am, you know, yet again yeah. in her world. And uh, I gave this speech. Now, they were only, I was only the fourth man in the building. There was the parish priest who would come in to teach the girls and hear their confessions. And there were the two 60-year-old uh, janitors, Nikki and Patsy. And here I am, and I'm the same age as the young women. Right? And, and I was, you know, a reasonably good-looking young man. And they could see from the stage that I was a bit charismatic. And 200 young women showed up that afternoon. And I began to... I, we, we never had tryouts uh, in the 15 years. I ended up doing this for 15 years. And I devoted, this is not an exaggeration, because you have to realize every Thursday after school, we would get in a van that I had bought and we would drive to Boston or upstate New York or Philadelphia or Washington. Uh, maybe on a long weekend or on a holiday, we'd get as far as Chicago or Miami. But we would drive in this van to tournaments. So Thursday through Monday, the young women who chose to stay on the team, because again, we never had tryouts. If, if you did the work and you had what we called spirit, spirit, what was spirit? You couldn't put yourself above the team. If you had those two characteristics, then we made sure that you had an opportunity to debate. We found tournaments appropriate. It was we didn't call it the debate team. We called it the society. Interesting enough, I look back on this, you know, I said, uh -huh. where did this uh -huh. come from? We called it the society. And when we went to tournaments, uh, usually by the time, because I was very demanding, the young women had to do very hard work on what was the topic for the whole year. They really had to study every nook and cranny of that topic, be prepared on both sides of the topic. And in addition to that, I very quickly, because I would have them from three o'clock when they got out of school till 10 o'clock at night, the parents would come and pick them up. at 10. So essentially, I was running a second school. The school itself was not very strong academically and not a large preponderance of the women went to college. They were the daughters typically of policemen or firemen, civil servants of one kind or another. There were exceptions, of course, but by and large, their horizons had not been set high. And, and of course, I came in and I expected them to excel. And I expected them to be national champions. And I learned that the most important thing that happens in a classroom is the expectation set by the teacher. Because they had no other information. And I believed in them. That was the most important thing I did was I believed in them, and if they worked hard, I was going to work hard to teach them all there was to know about the topic, and I had a good mind, and I, I read vociferously on the topic. And uh, the other thing it did, of course, was capture me for teaching, captured me completely. So for 100 hours a week, I poured myself into this, and I, I stopped going to class at Fordham. And, and Healy lost patience with me very quickly. By the end of my freshman year, he had thrown me out of the honors program. And uh, it's funny because at our 50th reunion, my roommates all remembered me as being top of the class because I would tutor them in subjects and so forth. But I never did any of the homework. I never did any of the compulsory reading. And I would always have to use their notes to just get by <laughs> in the final exams. I studied the night before. And thankfully, I had... Uh, some external scholarships. So even when Healy said, we're not investing in you anymore, 
And uh, that 15 years, I think, if you said to me, you can only live professionally 15 years, I wouldn't choose my 14 years as dean of the law school or my 14 years as president of the university. I would choose those 15 years. Every one of those young women went to college on a scholarship. And today, there are doctors, there are managing partners at major law firms, there are teachers, they're, but, and they're better people. Wow, what a story. And I guess you did deliver on your promise, didn't you, of taking them to a championship? Well, I, they, they, they won the national championship five times in the 15 years, and they're considered by some the leading, certainly the leading debate team of that generation. And the land is littered with national merit scholarship winning boys who debated against these young women with their Brooklyn accents. And, and I, I remember, when, when, now Larry Summers is one of the most brilliant people that walks the planet of the earth, you know, but three times he debated against my girls and three times he lost. And he can still <laughs> <remember> <laughs> one of those debates. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so it, it really, but, but that, it set off a chain reaction. And just to finish the story, in my senior year, I was going to class because I was in that 2.1 where you just, you located me and I was in danger. You needed a 2.0 to graduate. And so I, I was going to class and Tim Healy stopped me on the quadrant. And, and he said to me, you've been a big disappointment. And, and I said, well, I'm sorry Father Healy, but let me explain what, no, I don't want to hear what you've been doing. But he said, the, the Vatican Council is happening. The Vatican Council was five years long. Four of them were the four years I was in college. And the great theologian, Teilhard de Jardin, was living on the Fordham campus. And the, of course, the Fordham was a tremendously progressive Jesuit community. And uh, Healy said to me, uh, we're starting a PhD program in religion. And we'll give you a fellowship to get your PhD. We'll take another shot at you. We'll give you a second chance. And at the time, I felt very honored. Now, of course, having been on the other side of academic uh, programs, I realized he had gotten funding for this PhD program, and he had no students. And he looked out on the platform <laughs> and he said, who probably hasn't applied to law school or yet? Ah, there's that guy. He's bright. He probably, and he was right. I was preparing my kids for the national tournament. And studying religion, my, my father had died, as I said. So my mother couldn't complain. So I got my PhD in religion. And then I wasn't being paid. I never was paid during the 15 years for the teaching I did. It was a, just a vocation. It was something I cared about. In fact, In fact, I poured every creative and entrepreneurial piece of energy I had into raising the money because I, I had to raise, I, and I actually started two businesses along the way, all of which went into this debating team, never had a savings account for myself. And so I started teaching college at a small college in Brooklyn. I call it the Harvard of Brooklyn because it's the oldest college in Brooklyn, but that's the only similarity with Harvard. It's called St. Francis College. And I was a rarity. I was a lay Catholic with a PhD in religion from a Catholic university. So quickly they made me tenured and chairman of the department. And it wasn't until I turned 30 that a group of dear friends, included some names you might know, like Lawrence Tribe, and, uh, Larry w and I had known each other through debate, and Bob Shrum, the great political activist, and they did an intervention. They sat me down as I turned 30 on the Georgetown campus and they said, you've been doing this for 12 years with the girls. We applaud it. We love it. They were all debaters. And they said, but you've always said you want to go to law school and you should and we'll help you. So I applied at the age of 30 to five laws. My plan was to go to law school in New York. So I applied to Columbia, uh, NYU, Fordham, and Brooklyn. But Larry was writing me a letter of recommendation and he had just been tenured at Harvard. And he said, I want to be able to say that I recommended you to Harvard, apply to Harvard. So I applied to Harvard too. And all five schools turned me down. Thanks to your 2.1 GPA. The 2.1, but you also put it together, <laughs> 2.1 and then a PhD in religion. You know, what's that about? Is he smoking something? And then wait a minute, he's giving up a tenured job to come here. There must be a sealed file with a scandal in it. And then somebody puts up his hand and says, Oh, look at this. He drives around the country in a van with high school girls. You know, that's the scam. <laughs> it all fit, you know. And they all rejected me. But Larry went into the Harvard committee and said to them, how could you turn down someone I wrote a four-page single space letter for? And a woman named Molly Garrity, she was the assistant dean for admissions, 
called me in 1972 and she said, you've been accepted on reconsideration. So it was the only school to accept me. And I said, I can't come. And she said, what do you mean you can't come? And I said, well, I, I have these high school students and I've made a commitment to them. My plan was that I would go to law school before three o'clock in New York and then work with them. And when I graduated from law school three years later, if I hadn't taken any freshmen, everybody would have graduated. I said, would you accept me for three years from now? Uh, because otherwise I have to turn down the offer. And she said, I now believe what Larry told me about you and those young women. You're the first person accepted for 1975. And when I walked into the, my first class, my now NYU colleague, Arthur Miller's civil procedure class, we're now co-authors. There across the room was a woman. I'd never seen anything on earth like her. And two months later, we were married. That was Lisa. So it turned out well. Yeah, it did indeed. Uh, what a story. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, but that's my apologia for my 2.1 college grade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, John, there's a bunch of things I want to talk to you about. You know, you've had a really unique experience, I guess, as a legal scholar, but you've also clerked, you know, at the Supreme Court for, you know, Justice Warren Berger and a few others. And so I'm really sort of chomping at the bit to get your take on a couple of questions that I have around, you know, whether our laws currently are sufficient to deal with the world we are entering, you know, this world of technology and AI and machines, you know, so broadly, that's one of the areas I want to cover. And I also want to cover sort of how one looks at law, you know, and, and you're a big baseball fan. And, you know, in your book, you draw this analogy about, um, you know, whether justice is calling balls and strikes or whether it's something more, you know, where you're maybe, uh, you know, and I'm making this up, maybe, you know, you're making up the strike zone as you go along, right? So, you know, one of the fascinating questions I think that's emerging is sort of the role of evidence, data, machines, you know, in various parts of law. So that's the other sort of broad thing I want to cover. But I want to start with your background in religion and law and and government, because you teach a class or several classes here and in Abu Dhabi, sort of NYU has this global campus. And I know that you talk a lot about the relationship between religion, law, and government. How do you look at that? How should we think about that? You know, especially these days with the world being in the state that it's in, the situation that it's in, high degree of flux, high degree of uncertainty. How do these things impact each other? You know, how should we look at these three things? It's a, a question that has many dimensions uh, for me. Let me put out just a couple of lines of inquiry and then you pursue what you wish. So my most recent book, uh, Standing for Reason, draws an analogy between the religious world in which I've lived and the political world in which I've lived over the last 60 years. And it's, uh, it's interesting, 1956 is kind of a, uh, a place I can measure with deep memory. My, my, uh, so in 1956, I'm a freshman or sophomore in high school, and the great Jesuit priest Daniel Berrigan, literally, it's not an exaggeration to say, the, the Martin Luther King of the peace movement, uh, just a great man, it turned out, 10 years later, but here he was, a Jesuit priest teaching us religion in a classroom in Brooklyn. And he wrote on the blackboard the four Latin words, extra ecclesia nulla salus. Outside the church, there's no salvation. And I went up to him after class and I said, Father Berrigan, does that mean that, uh, that my best friend, Jerry Epstein, who's Jewish, can't go to heaven? And Danny Berrigan said to me, John, if you don't baptize him, he won't go to heaven. That was the orthodox teaching of my Catholic church in Irish Catholic Brooklyn in the 1950s. 60 years later, 2016, I found myself in Abu Dhabi at an ecumenical conference with representatives of 25 faith traditions, including the Pope. And they were talking about building a, a world of elevating faith where you not only professed triumphantly your own, but rather quite the opposite of triumphantly, you 
embraced the wisdom of the other tradition in what is called the dialogic dialogue, the real genuine dialogue of ecumenical thinking. So in 60 years, that arc theologically has been striking to me. And I've lived through the every stage of it as a person who studied religion seriously and then was a professor of religion and then got involved in issues of church and state. Now, meanwhile, and this is the end of the first kind of branch of this. Meanwhile, in 1956, my father was a major political figure in Brooklyn. He was the head of the Jefferson Democratic Club. But he worked with people of all political stripes to get the basics done for the people. Whereas 60 years later, and I'll speak only of the United States, but there are similar analogies in every part of the world. But you look at American politics today, there is a virulent, what I call secular dogmatism. I'm deliberately taking that word dogma from the theological side because dogma is revealed. You don't reason to dogma. Dogma is given to you by some greater authority. And now our politics has become secular dogmatism. And there's no, you can't speak across the divides any more than I could have an intelligent conversation with Jerry Epstein about the virgin birth or the resurrection of Christ. Hey, there's there, there, nothing to discuss. And we're in these kind of feedback loops as I was in a feedback loop with Rome. So, so critical reasoning didn't play a part in it and isn't now. So, and so there's a way in which I see this powerful analogy where we need, we need a secular version of ecumenism. Now, I know it can happen because I've seen it happen on the theological side. I know it can happen. So then that comes to the other angle that you might want to take into the relationship of these powerful instruments, church and government, how do they interrelate? You know, and of course, down through the millennia, they've been interrelating in different ways. And of course, uh, sometimes for very secular reasons or in unity with the secular wars have been fought, but under the flag of religion and the great dividing devices, clashes of civilization and the like are often intoned. And, and, and when I came to NYU in 1981, I was fresh off my clerkship at the Supreme Court of the United States, and I had already written, and now remember, I was an older student who had been a college professor, but I, I wrote in 1979 a piece in, in the Harvard Law Review, which to this day, it's a seminal piece. It set off a conversation that's still going on. The first 16 words of the First Amendment to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, first 16 words, everybody thinks speech or maybe press. The first 16 words are about the relationship of religion and government. And they say Congress today, after the 14th Amendment, we would say government. So I'll say government. Government shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And the Supreme Court had gotten active. It really didn't get active until the 1940s. So about 150 years went by when most of the action about the relationship of church and state was going on at the state level. There were some cases at the Supreme Court. But starting in the 1940s, and in part because of the sociological impact of World War II and people of various religions and races and so forth serving together in the armed forces and their coming home, uh, the rising middle class, all of those things come to play behind this. But the Supreme Court begins to get active. The first major case is 1947. So by 1981, the Supreme Court had decided yeah, maybe three dozen cases over that period. So maybe an average of one a year in various aspects of defining those 16 words. And when I came to NYU, I had written this article in the Harvard Law Review defining the word religion for purposes so government shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So there's special danger about this thing we call religion, and there's special rights, by the way, prohibiting the free exercise of religion. So there was a, an exemption from the selective service that Congress had passed, but it specifically said it was section 6J of the selection, Selective Service Act that if the basis of your objection, your conscientious objection, was religious, you got one. But if it was political or philosophical, you didn't get one. So what is the distinction? You know that, And I wrote really the first serious piece attempting to say what the framers meant and what they had to mean in terms of the contemporary. 
explosion of religious awareness that I had witnessed over my time as a serious student of religion, which started, remember, in 1963 when Tim Healy stopped me on the quadrangle. You know, in the late 1950s, the regents of the state of New York could write a prayer to be said at the beginning of every school day, and they collected a priest, a rabbi, as if all Jewish traditions were the same, and a minister as if all Protestant. And they thought they had the whole landscape. They didn't bring in a, a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Zoroastrian. <laughs> right. You had a priest, a rabbi, and a minister, any minister in the room. And they agreed this prayer is innocuous. Kids could say it in school. Well, the Supreme Court said no. The Supreme Court said no. And Douglas, in his opinion in that case, saying no, he's writing only for himself, shows off his knowledge of world religions. And says there's a lot more out there. Well, that's what I wrote in 1979 in that piece. There's a lot of other stuff out there. And then why, how is it? What's the essence of this thing we call religion? So when I got to NYU in 81, the leaders of the American Civil Liberties Union, Norman Dawson was the president of the ACLU giant of the NYU faculty. Bert Newborn, one of the most brilliant theoreticians that we had at NYU at the time, had been the legal director of the SL. And they asked me if I would take over the church-state portfolio for the ACLU, one of the great litigators in this area. I remember Bert saying to me, because I said, I want to teach a seminar on the relationship of religion and government. And Bert said to me, oh, I think all the issues have been settled. This was 19... <laughs> <laughs> and this was the most, probably the most informed person in the country, but they had just won in. It was the zenith of separation of church and state, and free exercise rights were kind of fringe issues for minorities, like could Native Americans use peyote and be exempt from prosecution under prohibited substances, and could the Amish withdraw their kids from school? So that was when I began my course on religion and government. So it's relating these two. So to, to summarize, I'm sorry to have gone on so long, but there are really two branches that I think of that are stimulated by uh, your invitation to talk about the relationship of government and religion. One is theological ecumenism as an analogy for the political or secular ecumenism for which we thirst. And I think there's a lot to be mined there by civil society because the techniques of a, not just, it's called dialogic dialogue. That's what the great theologian Raimundo Panikar called it, dialogic dialogue. So the techniques of real dialogue, which involves real listening, aggressive listening, as my colleague at NYU, Carol Gilligan says, they're there. And that's part of the solution. We have to develop structures to do it because it's not going to emerge on its own. But then over here is the perennial question that goes down through the ages of how you take the great power centers of church and state and interrelate them in society, and especially in a society like the United States, which has, has essentially said, we don't put them together at all. In the first 10 words of the Bill of Rights, government shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So that's a radical separation of church and state. But when you go to the back part, what comes after the or, because there are two clauses, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. You get to the free exercise, the liberty part of it. The first is institutional, the liberty part of it. So now it's government shall not make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Well, for decades, that was designed, as I say, to protect minority religious practice because it was a fear it would be squashed by the majority. But now in recent years, very interestingly, the cases that are getting to the Supreme Court now, the most recent one was brought by the Catholic Church in New York and synagogues in New York. These, this, so now the majority is using the free exercise clause and saying, we should be exempt from the governor's COVID rules. It's not my disease. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I wanted to <laughs> talk to you about that because, so that was just in November, if I remember correctly, November last year, where the Supreme Court ruled five to four against uh, Cuomo's order uh, prohibiting gatherings over a certain size. 
right? And so you're saying that the church invoked the First Amendment, saying that this doesn't apply to us. And then I would point out to you, the Catholic Church is pretty big. <laughs> this, so, so this is not like the Native Americans with peyote or the Amish with withdrawing their kids from school. And this is not the first time it's happened. So the people of faith, but majority, not, not majority, there's really no majority faith unless you really lump the Protestants together, but of large, well-represented in society religions, including the Catholic Church, attacked the provisions of Obamacare that required them, and notice the verb I'm going to use here, to cooperate with the provision of family planning services, including abortion to women under Obamacare, something that they were not required actively to do. They were not required actively to do, but they simply had to inform the insurance company that there were such people. Because it turns out for the insurance company, they can give that coverage away for free because it's cheaper to have people doing family planning than it is to deal with the results of not having family planning. So from an insurance and actuarial standpoint, it was a delight to give it. But the cases that came to the Supreme Court by big religions invoked the principles of the free exercise clause. And it's interesting because there's an opinion by Justice Scalia back in the 90s, which flattened some of those liberty guarantees traditionally used by the small religions, flattened them. But Congress then came into play. This is an interesting study in relation to the branches. Congress then came into play and passed by an overwhelming majority, more than 90 senators voted for it, what's called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which as a statutory matter says, okay, Scalia said the Constitution didn't do this. We want to give protect religious freedom. So many of the cases that are coming up now come up under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, but it's the same principle as the Free Exercise Clause. And it's the majority religions, case after case, that are invoking it. And it's one doesn't have to look far to see uh, claims brought, some have already been brought to the Supreme Court, around uh, the duty to provide services to people through sexual orientation you find as a religion, it, it is getting very, very thicky. And you're going to see, a, you know, a case or two a year now trying to untangle these principles, which have gotten very complex. There's a lot of clarity that there wasn't when I first started at this. To give you an, an easy example, the case I alluded to before about the Regent's Prayer. Uh -huh. right, so it's clear that you cannot start a public school day with a prayer that's been written by the government. Clear, right? By the mid-1980s, I was the lawyer in a case that we prevailed five to four to get invalidated uh, an Alabama statute which set aside a moment of silence for prayer. Meditation or prayer was what the statute read. A moment of silence. That was a hard case, and it should have been five four and uh, Sandra O'Connor writes a very good opinion saying, I'm only invalidating the Alabama law. There are 34 other moment of silence laws. I have to look at each one. These are very fact specific. But none of the nine justices, not even Rehnquist, who wrote a big dissent saying moment of silence statute should be okay, thought that you could write a prayer to be said. And so mm -hmm. people sometimes get caught up in the bow of the boat, I tell my students, you're going down a stream and there are currents of different philosophies in the stream. There are boundaries to the stream. You can go outside the boundaries. The district court judge, by the way, in the moment of silence case had gone outside the boundaries. He had said the Supreme Court got it wrong. If Alabama wants to write a prayer, they could write a prayer, he said. I'm saying that opinion back in 1960s was wrong. Mm -hmm. it took a picosecond for him to be reversed by the Court of Appeals and no one ever raised that again. But And Rehnquist didn't raise that clarity. It was behind the boat. It was the bow of the boat. And we got a lot of stuff coming at us at the bow of the boat on the relationship of religion and government over the next five years. So, you know, this takes me to a related topic, which is that our judges, you know, and I referred to this earlier, 
Are judges calling balls and strikes? <laughs> you know, you said that Justice Roberts said, you know, I'm calling balls and strikes. And then, you know, you juxtapose Bill Clem, one of the most famous uh, umpires in baseball, who said, you know, it ain't a strike till I say it's a strike. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so maybe sort of a, a more nuanced question here would be, you know, in which areas of law do you see the strike zone as being sort of well-defined, right? Where people are calling balls and strikes yeah, yeah, yeah. and other areas of law where it isn't well-defined. It's a, it's a matter of representation and interpreting the law and context in the current context. I mean, how do you tease those two apart? So I love the two quotes that you just uh, verbalized. The book I'm working on now, which is called uh, The Law, and I have to spell it L-A-W for those that understand it, don't understand a Brooklyn <laughs> accent. Yeah, I'm not saying L-O-R-E, but the, the, the law of baseball, colon, judges as umpires. And I put those two quotes right on the cover, which uh, I'm still finishing the book, but I've got the cover conceptualized. You know, one of my delights, this is now five years this month since I stepped down as president, and uh, I'm still, as you know, a, a tenured faculty member, and I teach a full schedule, and, and I was able to return to the law school. I had given up my teaching at the law school during my time as president because I had been in the odd position of appointing my own successor. That's a very odd thing to do, you know, <laughs> and then I even appointed his successor because he was dean for 11 years brilliant dean, and that now the present dean, my present boss, I should say, is uh, one of the great deans that I've ever encountered, period, anywhere. And uh, But I, I wanted to stay out of the way of the people at the law school, you know, not, not have people running in and run. So for 14 years, I stayed away. But now I'm back teaching at the law school, and I teach the first-year students, and I teach them the basic course in civil dispute resolution. And they have a phrase, it's interesting, one of them uh, was quoting it back to me in my office hours just this week. And it's living in the gray, living in the gray, that I'm going to teach them to live in the gray. That, and the issue that's captured both in his forthcoming book and in the, the quotes you have, uh, you know, is judges operate somewhere in between those quotes. They, they, neither quote accurately captures what judges do. And Upon, of course, I mean, John Roberts and I, law school classmates, and we clerked together. He was with Justice Rehnquist when I was with Chief Justice Berger. And, and we're friends. And I admire him greatly. I don't agree with him on a lot of things, but I admire him greatly. He's truly a great judge. And on cross-examination, he would not say that he as a judge was the equivalent of AI strike zone, <laughs> you, you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which you could see perhaps coming to baseball. but. Uh, Judges do more than that, he would concede. On the other hand, it's not what Bill Clem says. It ain't nothing till I tell you. It's in between. It's to go back to the analogy I used a bit ago, you're bounded. The river is bounded. There are certain things. Yes, there, there are different currents in the river and who you are, what your experiences are. You're still you go through the structure, for example, in determining what the religion clauses mean not expressing your own policy preference, but what is the meaning of those who wrote these words? Now, one can have a view, as Justice Scalia does, that it's a snapshot, you know, one moment in time, or as Justice Brennan does, that it's a motion picture that evolves. But as Brennan says, I'm still looking for what Jefferson and Madison meant by those words. But when I say I'm looking for what they meant, I'm looking for the principles that guided them and asking myself the question, with those principles, what they would, what would they say today? So they had a notion of privacy, but there was no such thing, no technological capacity for wiretapping. But that doesn't mean you can't apply the principles of price, privacy to the telephone and to wiretapping. And of course, the same thing is true in some of the areas you love to think about. But the judge is somewhere in between them. I mean, if you want, do you want me to tell a story that illustrates it beautifully, I think? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. So I clerked, as you indicated in the introduction, I clerked at the United States Court of Appeals for two great judges, a man named Harold Leventhal and a man named David Bazelon, each for six months. Judge Leventhal died very suddenly. Judge Bazelon brought me in. Bazelon was probably one of the most progressive judges of the 20th century, a great, great judge, and was the chief judge of the United States Court of Appeals in Washington when Warren Berger was a judge on that court. 
and they had huge battles. And it, it even became personal at times. When Warren Burger was appointed Chief Justice by Richard Nixon, the Washington Post called up David Bazelon and said, what do you think of your colleague being elevated to be Chief Justice? And David Bazelon said on the record, on the record, quoted in the Washington Post, I expect to be sick at home in bed for a week. That was his reaction. <laughs> it wasn't a word of complimentary. <laughs> you know, so, so anyway, I had worked on an important uh, First Amendment, not religion case. It was a speech case with Judge Bazelon on the D.C. Circuit. And it was a two to one decision. Bazelon wrote the majority. I worked with him on the opinion. And it went up to the Supreme Court. And sure enough, I went up to the Supreme Court, you know, the same. So, so it arrives, and uh, I obviously didn't take the case. My uh, co-clerk, James Volling, an outstanding lawyer in, out in Minnesota now, but Jim took the case and uh, worked with the chief on it. And the decision was five to four. Berger in the majority. And the senior judge in the majority gets to decide who's going to write the opinion. So Berger said to the court, I'm the senior judge in the majority, I'm going to write the opinion. So it had this added little delight of reversing David Bazelon. <laughs> he was now went off with my co-clerk Jim for a, a couple of weeks to write an opinion reversing this man, you know, just okay. And Jim kept uh, coming down to me and saying, you know, the chief is really struggling with this really struggling. And he had a phrase for it. He would say, it's just not writing. I was struck by that, by the way, that phrase, that it's just not writing well. And I know exactly how you feel. You try and write something down and it just doesn't come out the way you thought it should. Well, and that's, by the way, something that we in academe who are in serious research universities understand. You know, there's singing in the shower. You know, or some insight you get in the middle of the night that you write down on an index card. But then when you have to write it down in a pathway argument that's going to be going into a jury journal, it's a different thing. You know? For sure. For sure. And, and of course, the Supreme Court doesn't have to submit their stuff to jury journals, but there are seven or eight thousand people out there called law professors whose whole job it is to write articles critiquing their work product, you know, and what a, a legal opinion is is a pathway argument. And it's a pathway argument. Never forget this about the Supreme Court. It's a pathway argument in an institution that has a remarkable commitment to thought. I, I mean, other than the Supreme Court and other courts that behave like it, but take the Supreme Court as, a, as the paradigmatic example. Here is the exercise of real power but a commitment to explain every exercise of power in writing with a pathway justification for it and to co-publish differing opinions. I mean, what an unbelievable commitment to the process of thought and reason, mm -hmm. right? So this is not simply a strike zone and a computer. Right. A path. So Berger said to Jim, it's just not writing. And, and, and finally, he called all four. We, there were four clerks. He called us all down. We had a conversation for a couple of hours. And he said to Jim, you know, I think David, meaning David Bazelon, got it right. And he said, send the conference. That's what the nine justices are called. Everything's done after the initial conversation and initial vote. Not binding, but initial mm -hmm. by memo. Send a memo out saying, it's still 5-4, but it's 5-4 to affirm Bazelon. And I'm now still the senior judge in the majority, uh -huh. and I'll write uh -huh. the opinion. And he wrote the opinion, and the opinion, the final vote on the case was 7-2. to Now, that is what we hope the Supreme Court is. The danger is that it becomes too much like Bill Clem, or that they fool themselves into thinking they're too much like simply calling balls and strikes. There's there's a struggle. There's a living in the gray. Because when a case gets to the Supreme Court, it's not a clear case anymore. It may look as the prayer case does 
50, 60 years later, it looks like a no-brainer. Of course, you can't just have a priest or rabbi and a minister get together and write a prayer and make everybody say it. Right. But it didn't look, it wasn't so clear at the time. My mother could say, who was ever hurt with a prayer? But she had no concept of of the world's religions or of atheism as a deeply held belief or right. whatever. So this, by the way, is the justification for the kind of university that uh, you helped create at NYU, the motto of which was play another octave of the piano. If there's notes you haven't touched, if there's a music you haven't heard, if there's a food you haven't tasted, reach out and play them. Widen your experiences. Of course, if you've grown up in a neighborhood where the only two religions are Catholics and Jews, <laughs> you know, you're not going to think yeah. much about whether or not this is a prayer a Buddhist can say or a Hindu can say, let alone an atheist. So that's a fascinating story, by the way, John, and thanks for sharing that. And I guess the other danger, and I forget who quoted this, is that where justices are viewed as politicians in robes. I don't know who yeah, said I that. Sometimes but... say we don't want to reduce the Supreme Court to the House of Representatives. Right, exactly. Then the boundaries are gone. Right. The boundaries of the river are gone. Now, you can have a notion of an evolving constitution because as the river goes down, you know, this is a thing my, I try very hard to teach my first year law students. And I do it with a simple question, okay, because I'm doing formal dispute resolution. So what gives a court power over a particular person? Now, the plaintiff chooses the court. So voluntarily says, I'm here, you have power over me. But the plaintiff pulls the defendant into court. Now, in the most rudimentary form, it was, could the sheriff of the jurisdiction of the court arrest the defendant and bring him in? <laughs> uh-huh. So if you got over the border from New York to New Jersey, the New York court had no jurisdiction over you. But obviously, with, as commerce developed and so forth, you could be present in different ways other than physical and so forth and so on. Well, I want you to know, in the 14 years I was away from the law school, I taught this every year. Because as you know, through my time as dean and president, I taught a full faculty schedule. So when I was dean, I taught civil procedure every year, right up until 2001. And then I went away. And between 2001 and when I came back in 2016, Boy, the Supreme Court got active in this area and things got all different currents and so forth. But the great thing about it is the people that were making the changes were people that if you, as a typical law student said, all right, now this decision by the Supreme Court makes it harder for plaintiffs to get to bring into court in the state the plaintiff wants to litigate in and the state where the plaintiff's been injured to bring into court a multinational corporation, a big corporation. Boy, that's, that doesn't strike me as a good, you know, firebrand young law student is a good thing. The plaintiff's always right. And who was the architect of that change? Ruth Ginsburg. So then they say, wait a minute, I, I've been taught RBG. <laughs> you know, well, mm -hmm. so that you learn that principles can go forward, but tributaries come in. Because the court, when it answers a particular question, like that prayer question, it doesn't have every possible question down the line in mind. Right. And when the kaleidoscope turns and a little tributary comes in here to the river or whatever. So this is the wonderful thing about the organic nature of law. And it, it kind of, you know, you had said one of the other questions you wanted to discuss was, you know, the influence of, of AI and tech and how is that changed. Cardozo said, the law never is. It's always becoming. So coming to that, what is becoming, right? And, and one of the things I started with was whether our laws are actually adequately equipped to deal with this emerging brave new world of tech and whether they will have to be modified. And we're seeing this play out now in Congress. You know, there have been a couple of meetings on big tech. And, you know, Section 230 that gives them immunity from lawsuits. Where do you think we are in the state of law vis-a-vis -vis big tech? Well, you know, I, I think it's very easy uh, to, to become Jeremiah over these things, uh, you know, to see everything as an apocalyptic change. As I say, and as Cardozo said, the law is adaptive. Now, 
is big tech and AI likely to produce change and challenges we're not ready for? I gave you one already. Wiretapping and the telephone, you know, was not there in 1789 or 1791. So how do we adapt? And do we do it? You know, there are three ways law adapts. Don't miss this. We think of everything in America with the big C constitution word, but there there are statutes. See here the example I gave earlier where Scalia flattened religious liberty rights, but Congress came in the wake and said, no, no, we're restoring them because we Mm -hmm. can pass a statute that says we, the federal government, restore these liberty rights. And then there's what's called in the trade common law, which is judge law. You know, the vast amount of law day in and day out in the course of the United States is judge-made law that goes back in an antecedent way to the Norman conquest and the courts of common law because of the concept that, for example, if somebody breaks a contract or somebody is negligently injures someone else, these things tend to be developed in a case-by-case basis. But the key thing is the case number one is a precedent for case number two. So by law speaking in case number one, and and that is where a lot of the evolution of law comes in society as society changes, by the examination of justice in a particular case. So let me put the question a, a slightly different way. So previously, we've assumed that all of the reading of documents, discovery, everything is done by humans, right? And... In, you know, just reading about on your background, I noted that you were deeply involved in the Love Canal case from way back in the 80s. And I think you mentioned to me that, you know, something like 80,000 documents had been protected for some reason. And you were required to actually go through each one of them and decide whether it was revealable. I I forget the exact words, but that's like, uh, that's a huge amount of work for humans to be doing. And (laughs) tell me. Yeah, and you know, so a lot of sort of law requires just reading stuff, processing information, right? And traditionally, this has been done by humans, right? One way or the other, humans had to sit down and do the best they could. Sometimes they did a better job than at other times, right? But now we've got this new entity called the computer and, and AI that's come into the picture. And I can imagine that if you were doing the Love Canal case now, you might have actually said, hey, you know, why don't I use this uh, software that can sort of automatically read these documents and give me a summary and just save me a lot of time and effort and actually improve my uh, capability. You know, but at the same time, that also imposes the risk that the computer can make a mistake or that it might come up with something that's misleading. So, you know, but yet we don't seem to have any thinking around you know, things like intentions when it comes to computers, which we do with humans, right? You can say, well, you know, here was the intent. And that's where I'm coming from with this new entity that's part of making sense of our world. Is this introducing new risks? Will we see, yeah, what what impact is this going to have on law? So with apologies, I'm going to make it a little more complex as I try to give clarity, okay? But I think it's useful to think about the issues you raise in a set of different uh, boxes. So when I was talking about the adaptability of the law, the way over time principles can evolve, it's clear, and this is not what's raised with your immediate question, I just want to name it and identify it, that this world we've entered has about it significant features that sound at the most fundamental level of principle in the American constitutional system. So there are issues of privacy that they're in some ways similar. One can find analogies before this time, but the the exponential power of technology and AI poses whole different questions of privacy. There are questions of rights of expression, you know, and whether or not the traditional civil libertarian answer of uh, no content evaluation, but the solution to speech is more speech is sufficient in this world when you combine bots and technology and 
the ability to mine uh, based on your purchases and everything else, what might hit your particular persuasion, and to overwhelm you then with information. That raises issues of rights of expression and where you put the dial that aren't so simple in a world that's amplified the way this world is. The evaporation that comes with the the extraordinary explosion of information that is available now, the evaporation of a common, this is one of, I think, the key things that's leading to this secular dogmatism we've referred to earlier. There's, there's just no, there's not a common source. There, what we're discovering in the last few months is there aren't common facts even that people can look. So I'm going to put those to the side. I just want to I name them and identify them and say that my experience is that the law will adapt in those ways. The mistake would be to assume that we have to stay with the same rules we've always used in a far simpler, less amplified world. Mm -hmm. Now, the questions you just asked actually go in a different direction. There's no question that at a number of levels, the practice of law is going to be transformed and the practice of dispute resolution which is an element of law, but an important element of law. It deals only with the pathologies, but resolving disputes among parties when a patholo- Most contracts work, but one is, in the view of one side or the other or both, breached. How do you resolve that dispute, right? That's a pathology, right? Mm-hmm. So there's no question that the practice of law is going to be very deeply affected by artificial intelligence and technology. And Part of the reason for that is that now the world of civil procedure, this dispute resolution course that I teach, operates deeply in what's called complex litigation. It is not an unusual phenomenon uh, for lawsuits to have hundreds of thousands, even millions of parties. It's not one plaintiff and one defendant, you know, the slip and fall case. You're now dealing with the effects of you know, Agent Orange or, you know, of the failure of a part in an automobile and all of that comes from that, you know, and then that leads to in a world where we set a basic principle in motion about uh, 75 years ago that we were going to give access to the courts. And because frequently plaintiffs did not have, and think about this, any number of contexts right down to the trial that's going to take place in the Senate in two weeks, the plaintiff doesn't initially, or the prosecutor in the case of that trial, doesn't always have access to the inner thinking of the defendant, at least at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So you get involved in real discovery, which means going through literally, it can be millions of documents, (laughs) emails, and Mm -hmm. things of that sort. Then you get claims of privilege, such as you alluded to in the, the government made claims of privilege on those 80,000 documents. Some person or something had to make decisions about which of those were and were not. There's no question that in the inside of complex litigation, you'll see artificial intelligence doing a lot of the work that was done by humans. And your instinct is right about the Love Canal litigation, okay? Now, the important thing to remember is you're not having a final adjudication. What's being determined there is simply whether a particular document is useful to the plaintiff, because part of it is going through and discovering it. No claim of privilege will be made. Then when claims of privilege are made, part of it can be what the presumptive ruling, presumptions Mm -hmm. in the law, what the Mm -hmm. presumptive ruling of privileged or not privileged can be. So my prediction will be that we'll begin to integrate more and more technology and artificial intelligence to get through an awful lot of the work that was done by humans, lawyers back 40 years ago, paralegals 20 years ago. Now it'll be done at least as an initial pass using technology and artificial intelligence That's just getting through the anatomy, the database of this complex litigation we're dealing with. Now, when it comes to adjudication, 
I think where technology and artificial intelligence is likely to be most usefully employed is uh, when you get to the remedy phase. So let's say you have uh, Agent Orange, for example, and judgment is made. Here's a multi-billion dollar fund that is created, which the defendant must pay. Now you get to the question of how do you distribute it among the many claimants to that fund? And, And here again, this word presumption, you can create a set of presumptive categories and artificial intelligence and technology could be used to sort the various potential claimants on that fund into categories. But they would have a right to appeal if they were unsatisfied with the category into which they were sorted. And there'd be certain rewards. So there are ways to use this. But you know the great ascending hierarchy of data, information, knowledge, wisdom. Right. Right. It's when you get to that wisdom where you're between the quote from John Roberts and the quote from Bill Clem. That's where the judge comes in and mm-hmm. has to provide wisdom. Because in the system, whether it be constitutional, statutory, or judge-made law, the judge there, as the wise participant, is generating law. It's part of this evolving process, and that's where you want a human involved, at that moment of creativity. That makes uh, total sense. And and thanks for really mapping that out so clearly. I mean, I can see that sort of, you know, the data information knowledge and the wisdom and the human part that you want to leave with the human judge is the, is the wisdom part. And, you know, I can see in the dispute resolution, right, I can see a lot of the sort of grunt work being done by machines. And again, in the sort of adjudication, I mean, you know, naively, I can see Uh, And you may have actually, in our previous conversations, described it in these terms that, you know, you want to put claimants into one of nine boxes, you know, boom, the machine does that, and it's done really efficiently, but there is recourse. Right. And so you can potentially get the best of, you know, what the machine can do and apply human wisdom when it's really necessary. So that makes a lot of sense. There is another dimension to this, which we haven't mentioned, and I would defer here to the the writing of... uh, a great colleague of mine who is the other person in this conversation. And that is, is the whole notion of what happens to duty of care when one turns things like driving over to machines. And uh, the data, the gross data, is uh, that machine drivers will be much better than human drivers. But in the particular case, you still... So that's something that gets into the substantive law of duty of care. And uh, there I have a high confidence that the norms, because that's, a, as I say, a third category where what's being raised is norms, norm setting for behavior. Uh And, you know, in your writing, you put it appropriately and brilliantly in a kind of risk-reward aggregate analysis. But the purpose of the rules of, in this case, let's say torts, where do you set liability? Where you move that dial, and it's very much a dial. There, It's not a binary issue where there's a right answer and a wrong answer. Where do you move the dial as you move towards a higher degree of care being required or a lower degree of care being required? Right. And that is all risk-reward analysis. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you're not going to get perfect justice, but you get very good justice, you know, given the resources that you have. And incentives, it's not just the justice. But but what I'm trying to come back to is the justice system does law speaking in areas like contracts, torts, uh, and and so on. What you're trying to do is set a norm for society that incentivizes behavior of a certain kind. Right. I'll give you a simple, very current rule that uh, will be hotly debated over the next uh, year or two, maybe beyond. You take a rule like the Senate cloture rule, which requires 60 people to continue debate in the Senate. So that's the supermajority requirement that uh, McConnell and uh, Schumer were arguing about, you know, and the Mm so-called nuclear option and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you were to change that rule to say you needed uh, 41 people to halt debate, the, the mathematics is the same. But the statement of the rule 
has a bias in in favor of continuing conversation mm-hmm. or discontinuing conversation, depending upon which way you do it. Now, with the 60 votes to continue, the 40 don't even have to show up. Mm-hmm. So every this is where the wisdom comes in to the statement of rules, and you go beyond uh, the simple capacities in my view, or at least where you want to repose the capacity. You can if you want, but I would be against reposing too much capacity in artificial intelligence. So John, in the, in the time we have left, uh, I want to move to education, since that's uh, an area that, you know, you have been uh, in for all, you know, most of your life, and you, you know, you were president of NYU for almost two decades. So, I, you know, I want to start with uh, a criticism that someone, you know, one of my previous uh, guests leveled against universities, you know, that we've somehow sort of lost the script in our quest for, you know, exceptionalism, right? We want the best and we take pride in turning away, you know, 90% of the applicants, right? So that's viewed as sort of, a, a, you know, a, a badge of quality, a hallmark of quality is the number of people who turn away. And I think the analogy he drew was like a homeless shelter saying, you know, we're going to, we take great pride that we've turned 90% of the people away. So has this fixation with, you know, elitism and exceptionalism really impacted society negatively in that we've sort of ignored the majority of us who are unremarkable, you know? And, you know, so I, I want to Put that question to you. You know, how do you respond to this kind of criticism? Because I can't but feel that there's an element of truth to it, that we do, in fact, want exceptional people. We always want to go for the best. And we sort of lose sight of the fact that, you know, there are lots of people who just haven't had the opportunity. Some people are late bloomers, you know, that by definition, most people are unremarkable and that the mission of American universities should be to bring sort of knowledge to everyone, and especially the people who need it the most, you know, who aren't in a position to compete right off the bat and, you know, get into these top schools. What's your response to that? Well, my first response is I'm very glad that you didn't name the person who said that, because it's likely to be a colleague of ours, uh, given the way you select the people that you interview. And, uh, I wouldn't want to be in a position of criticizing as aggressively as I'm about to. All that's conflated into that. I, I, I mean, you spoke for about a minute or two, and there were like two dozen different issues conflated into the two paragraphs, each of which is contradictory of the other. Let me try to sort this out. First of all, uh, just as a factual matter, my guess is that if the claim is we want to spread higher education more broadly. My guess is that we're at multiples today of people getting higher education worldwide, worldwide, than we were 50 years ago, 25 years ago. Okay, so there's been a huge democratization of the availability of education. And uh, the tendency of people when they talk about issues like the ones that are bundled up. And I really have to emphasize, there's a lot bundled up there. I'm going to try to sort out without going through everything, some of the issues I see in there. The tendency of people is is to talk about education as if higher education consisted of the hundred schools that New Yorkers like to talk about at their cocktail parties. And, and the fact of the matter is that, uh, let's just take American higher education. So the GI Bill democratized American higher education radically. There's a whole phenomena that began in the 1980s with the first publications of the U.S. News and World Report rankings, which combined with uh, large trends that were beginning in the United States, one of which was that Ronald Reagan began to teach that higher education was a private good, not a public good. Dramatically different from Abraham Lincoln, who in the middle of the Civil War created the land-grant colleges and said higher education is a public good and viewed higher education the same way that America has traditionally viewed K-12 through education as a public Mm -hmm. good. 
and, and that made a major change in higher education, broadly seen, broadly seen, because because it was a private good and not a public good, the assumption was you should borrow because you will get the benefits of this. And to the extent that society gets a benefit, another thing began to creep into the picture, which is, and this is where I think higher education has been acting at its peril, even at the the elite level, those hundred schools, those hundred cocktail party schools, all right? Uh, Mm -hmm. And that is we began to judge higher education on a utilitarian norm. Uh, I remember when sometime around 2005, I I was the president of NYU and uh, the leaders, the presidents of the 60 leading research universities get together twice a year for two or three days. And and there's an association, the Association of American Universities, that is the, the 60 leading research universities. And I remember when, uh, at the instance of an NYU law school graduate who has not uh, distinguished himself in recent times as he cooperated with the mendacity and perfidy of President Trump, uh, but uh, Lamar Alexander, at his instance, he had been the Secretary of Education, a commission was created, and, and a wonderful man, I think he was the head of Boeing, named Norm Augustine, the former CEO of, of Boeing, ran it with the research universities, and they came out with a major report, which was called Rising Above the Gathering Storm. And the motif of that report, and I was like Cassandra saying, beware, beware, beware. The motif of that report was strictly utilitarian. And it was based on a premise of competitiveness. How does American education preserve its status in a competitive world such as to drive the economy? And of course, big science was lionized. And of course, I'm all in favor of big science. But again, part of what came from that was a drift in the direction of immediately useful science as opposed to the kind of basic research that was being done at a place like Bell Labs or the great research universities. And what I said back then was, we're selling our soul. You know, this higher education, yes, has all kinds of utilitarian justifications, but to make competitiveness, knowledge is a positive sum game. It's not a zero sum game. In any case, that's another large trend that was happening. But I was the head of the Independent Colleges Association in New York State. I was the head of the American Council on Education. When I say the head, I mean the chair, not the, not the full-time head. It was a full-time head, but I served as chair of these organizations because my practice was not to take compensated boards, but I would take boards that were mission-driven for higher education all during my time as dean and president. So I tended to end up being chair of these. And I remember as chair of the organization, we, of the American Council of Organization, Education, we commissioned a study of graduates five and 10 and 15 years out by a very sophisticated political pollster. And we had 24 different membership colleges and universities. Now, the American Council on Education is not the research, unit, that's the Association of American Universities. This is 5,000 colleges and universities including community colleges, including faith-based small places, including major liberal arts colleges, including big research universities, including the the whole smorgasbord of higher education, you see, which that's the key that people miss because they think about the 100. Mm -hmm. And what came back, it was amazing. These very sophisticated political pollsters came back. They said, we have never seen positive results like this. Every question we asked of these graduates five years, 10 years, 15 years out, would you go back and do it? Would you pay the tuition that's being paid today? All those questions, answers beginning with nine, 90% or above, with one exception, one exception. There was one that was low 80s, like 81, still good, but it stood out as being different from the others. What was that question? Did your college or university education prepare you for your first job? And the poll still lamented. That there was suddenly what had been five or ten percent jumped to twenty or twenty-five percent. I forget what it was, but it was a considerable jump. Mm-hmm. It was at least a double. Mm-hmm. And I put up my hand. And I said, "You know, 
If I had answered that question, yes, the Jesuits would have killed me. They didn't want to prepare me for my first job. They wanted me to, to prepare me for a, a joyful and fulfilling and useful life. But all of this has happened. Now, now, look, to come back to where you started on this, there's a set of the 5,000 American universities, a very small number. I mean, under 500 that are, quote, selective, close quote, and an even smaller set that is, quote, highly selective, close quote. But those are the cocktail party schools that people talk about. Okay, and there are universities out there in the grand orchestra. Right Now, the key to all of this, and I've written this in my latest book, the key to all of this is not saying, first, first of all, we shouldn't make the status of a school turn on how many people it turns down. I take your, your homeless analogy for that, right? That was something that was imposed on higher education because it was easy to measure by the measurers that, you know, Americans love lists. They want to know what the best university mm-hmm. in the country is. There is no best university in the country. There is, it is an existentially incorrect question. The question is, what is the right university for this young person? If you have a person that should be at Juilliard School of Music and you put them at MIT, he made a mistake. The story of this country is the sucking up of slots in the cocktail party schools by the children of the affluent. 60% of the spots, 60% of the spots in the top 100 schools go to people from the top quintile of family income. Now, you know, unless you're a racist, intelligence is distributed isomorphically <laughs> I mean, it shouldn't be distributed by zip code what's missing right so so what's the problem with this picture though? the problem with this picture is a set of things and in my book in the fourth part of my argument for the ecumenical university i say a university can't be an ecumenical university unless all voices that deserve to be and want to be in the conversation are represented and if we're going to use sorting devices, I mean, this is the equivalent of voter suppression. <laughs> you're, su- you're suppressing voices. So my perfect school in this regard, because I was allowed to create it from the beginning with perfection as the goal, it's not achieved, but the one that comes closest to my ideals is NYU Abu Dhabi, where the admissions process is scouts, a thousand scouts out all around the world in the Masi Mara. In, in the poor areas of India or Brazil or whatever. And you find the talent and you bring them in and everybody's interviewed. And the question asked, even of the ones that come in with perfect numbers, do you resonate with the ratio studiorum of this school? This school has a mission. So I tell the students there, don't let anybody ever call you an alumnus. You're a senior member of the mission. I did a Zoom call this morning with a woman that graduated four or five years ago. I said, keep on the mission. What's the mission? To create an ecumenical world of conversation among leaders. Now, if you want the leaders of the world, there's a certain amount of selectivity involved in that. It is an elite group, but it's it's not elitism. They're not chosen based on the fact that they come from an elite zip code. They're chosen because they've gone through a process that shows they match and resonate with the particular goals of that school. Now, another school, St. Francis College in Brooklyn, where I was chairman of the religion department, has a completely different mission and should be matching with it. So the solution is that vast numbers of people, A, don't know it makes a difference if they go to college, so they're not making a choice to go to college or not. Not everybody should go to college. Probably my estimate is maybe 40, 50% of people should go to college. Others should be have other pathways to dignified lives that just don't require what you do in college. Okay? Uh, but people should at least know it can make a difference. Number two, it makes a difference where you go to college. So if you're a great musician, Juilliard's the place to go, not MIT or the equivalents. Okay, so just got to get that basic information to people that don't have the 
family infrastructure to know that. We have to get them that information. Then we have to give them information and we have to produce and demand that the 5,000 colleges and universities produce transparent data on their nature. So I used to say to parents, admitted students, not, not yet coming to NYU, but admitted students, I would say to them, look, if your child wants a kind of straight down the, the center utilitarian education, you should not send them to NYU because we're building in all kinds of premiums that if they never take advantage of them, if they never take advantage of studying away, if they never take advantage of the various uh, collateral intellectual activities we have because we're a research university, if they never do any of that, you're paying for it. You shouldn't, you, you're buying. When you want a car to go pick up the groceries, you don't buy a Ferrari. So we have to give data on what we are, which can be enforced through the peer group processes of the accreditation agencies. Every n number of years, you have to articulate, you have to data, how does your data link with that? And then we have to get, it is a wonderful organization created by an NYU uh, student named Nicole Hurd. I'm on her board, called the College Advisory Corps, which is, uh, it takes kids who have made it out of neighborhoods where, which are underrepresented in the United States. It's just in the United States. And they've gone to colleges or universities and graduated. And it gives them two or three year fellowships to go back into the neighborhoods they came from and work with kids that don't have any idea what a FAFSA form is or to get them the information and work with them and, and get them to the right part of the orchestra. And it might be a community college or it might, it might be a faith-based school. That's where the wonderful symphony orchestra of American higher education is. And schools should be judged not with a mission creep towards, you know, everybody wants to be like whatever the alpha school is defined as being, but, uh, and still less with how many you reject. But listen, if you've created something like NYU Abu Dhabi, NYU Abu Dhabi only accepts, I think it's two or three, no more than 4% of the students that apply there. And, you know, but, and they tend to be very, very top in terms of their academic records and so forth and so on, or some other demonstrated capacity because the kid from the, from the Masimara is not going to have a, a high school transcript to send in an SAT score, but they're going to demonstrate a capacity to lead and comprehend. And it's a complex problem, but easily solved. What's intolerable is the following. There are 40 million, four zero million children in the world today that will go through their entire lives without seeing a teacher. Not one day of school. And the work that I do with Gordon Brown, there are, there are 350 million children in the world today who won't get past the fifth grade education. And in the United States, there are many, many children who have no realistic expectation of getting to a college. And many of them, you know, the amazing data, and this is all in my book of last year, Standing for Reason, the amazing data is the amount, the plague on the United States higher education is what's called undermatching. And that is Bill Bowen did a huge study, former president of Princeton, head of the Mellon Foundation, huge study in which he surfaced this undermatching. And you control for everything else, and you've got kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds who systematically either don't go to college, and the data is striking how many never go to college, who are qualified to go and as qualified to go as their peers who come from higher quintiles of socioeconomic status. But even more than that, the son. When they go to college, they go to a less good college than they should. Now, is that because they don't have sort of what I call the social currency? They don't, they have don't know where to look. Currency, and there's also a phenomenon where they're identified and they get brought down mm -hmm. with merit scholarships mm -hmm. to less good places. And that gets back to this Reagan thing of the financing of higher education. And yet none of this means anything if when you identify the right uh, school for a young person, they can't afford to pay for it. And we created something at NYU Law School in the early 90s called Income Contingent Repayment. Uh, 
Gordon Brown put it in in the UK. It's called the graduation tax. Australia does it now as well. A lot of good work out of Brookings on it. And uh, the Biden administration started to phase it in in what's called pay as you earn. So you go to the best college you can. The government will lend you the money to go there. And when you graduate, the first N amount, let's say $40,000, $50,000 of your income is exempt. And then you repay your loans with never more than 10% of what's above forty dollars or $50,000 repaying the loans. And after 10, 15 years, whatever the balance is, is forgiven. So, you know, it's a highly efficient program. There's still pressure on the system to keep costs down, but there's not an artificial pressure on the system to suppress costs where they're hurting quality. So, John, I really appreciate you taking the time. Before we wrap up, just two quick questions. One is, what advice do you give to young people these days? Actually, let me just make that one question. Uh, Forget about the second one. So what is the advice you'd give someone in high school at the moment? How should they think about education and life going forward? So I spent a lot of time talking to students and friends of my children and grandchildren. The single most important thing is follow your passions. There's too much in this world now, the last couple of generations of people doing something now to get to something else, you know, and just follow your passions. My, my Katie, I remember when she was in her third year and she was at Yale in an extremely good art history program and she had a job coming up at Christie's for the summer and almost that almost guaranteed her a job at Christie's afterwards. And she wrote me an email one night. This was after Lisa had died. So here I was, you know, the the guru. And she says, dad, you know, I just am setting up the summer. And uh, I just realized that they'll offer me a job most likely. And if I go to work at Christie's and I'm in that job for four or five years, I'll become a department head and at that point, my salary will break the poverty line. So does this make sense? Because I want to be an independent woman. I, I don't want to be dependent on my spouse. I want to be able to give our kids something. And uh, does this make sense? Please answer as my practical dad, not my follow your passions dad. And I wrote back, I said, dear Katie, this is your practical dad speaking, colon, follow your passions. <laughs> you'll do it better and you'll you'll never know what's going to come and the, the corollary is you got to keep your needs low don't let your needs escalate especially material needs keep your needs low if you keep your needs low and you're you're smart and you follow your passions you're going to have a joyful and fulfilling life and you know don't get caught up in the external badges of excellence Go for the internal, find out what your passions are, and then follow it. That means choose your college based on that, not based on some list that was put out by somebody else for cocktail party conversation. So I like that point about keep your requirements, or maybe you said needs. Um, But I guess the other side about, or the other question about passions, I guess some people don't know what their passions are, right? It's just, you know, you say, well, your passions, I don't know. Like, uh, I don't know, do, tell me, do. tell me what the possibilities are. So maybe it's a question of like finding what it is you're uh, good at you see, and, and, and developing a passion for it. Well, yeah, uh, but, but see, this is where the maxim on which the Global Network University at NYU was built, my great teacher Charlie's phrase, play another octave of the piano. I like that. If there are no like that. you haven't touched, if yeah. there's a food you haven't eaten, if If there's a place you can get to, if there's a music you haven't heard, if there's a kind of person you've never met. So the more you play more notes and octaves, the more experiences you give yourself, that's all of a sudden something says, wow, this I enjoy. And follow it through. This is comes back to where you started. This is my 2.1 college grade point average because I was following my passion. And this is now my 60th year of teaching. I have never taken a sabbatical. Even when I was president and dean and now as president emeritus, I teach more than you do and more than any. I, so last semester, I taught four full courses. And I've never as president or dean taught less 
and I don't call it a load. It is by, by the way, load. Right, right. By the way, so you were traveling to Abu Dhabi every week, isn't that right? Every other week, except one semester, every, I did every week. Right. And, uh, you know, it, I just happened to be there one week. You were there welcoming the first, the inaugural class to NYU Abu Dhabi. And I just happened to be there for a, another event. And I still remember you gave the speech about feeling vulnerable. You know, for some reason, I, I still uh, remember that uh, speech. It was captivating. I mean, you spoke for 60 or 90 minutes, and it was all about feeling vulnerable. I'm, I'm sure you remember that story. Um, but, I, you know, I like the, you know, this notion of playing another octave. You know, that's kind of, I think at the end of the day, that's sort of what it's about, right? Just get outside your sort of normal comfort zone and explore. And I think you will find your passion, you know, as long as you sort of keep exploring and looking for that octave that you haven't played. That's the heart of a liberal arts education. Indeed. Well, John, I uh, really thank you for spending the time. It's been fascinating. And uh, really thank you for sharing your perspectives with the rest of the world. Thank you, Vasant, for being the extraordinary colleague and friend that you are. We've had many, many years together. And I don't think I've ever had a conversation with you where I haven't learned. Learned both about myself more by the way you will listen things and cause me to look at things differently but you also teach me so much and get me thinking about so much because you're on the cutting edge of uh, so many issues so thank you and good luck thank you john that was very kind of you <laughs>